Yeah, so thank you again, Khalid, for blessing us with some, some words to start us out. Um, really, I think, you know, beautifully capturing uh, this complexity of black experience and that we are all, you know, that, that there is um, the, sac the sacred in uh, the profane, right, and the secular as well. So um, before we start our first panel, we're gonna go to our first uh, set of clips from Media Burn. Um, and uh, this one features a short clip from the journalist uh, Vernon Jarrett um, talking about uh, a bit about great migration and um, uh, black folks imagining uh, themselves in Chicago space uh, and uh, belonging here. Uh, followed by a clip by, from the House of Avant Garde, um, a sh Chicago based um, um, group uh, that uh, are also thinking about how uh, to give us more history and context for the ways that black folks have imagined belonging in this city and then shown up for each other through kind of vogue uh, in the, the 90s. Um, so Joe's gonna play those clips now and then we will be going to our first panel. Corner Mark Luther King Drive, right here, Vern. 47th Mark Luther King Drive, the year's 1985, Vern Jarrett. What's your first thought? Let me tell you, I have a great emotion about this corner because this corner is in fact um, a terminal point of the great dream that so many black people envisioned, and I was one of them, prior to World War II. And I can recall standing right here, Studs, yeah. and feeling that I had arrived. Yeah. 1942. This was the, the vortex, as it were, the center of black emotions about the future. She went like about Vernon Jarrett is he brings the South with him. Yeah. He brings the small town memory and the big city sophistication. And it's that combination that's almost the key to Chicago. I discovered that Chicago was also a racist city. Yeah. But 47th Street said that's all right because we're moving ahead and on Saturday night you saw your own people looking prosperous and I felt for the first time that I had a future. I remember buying my first suit, a double-breasted, chalk-striped gray suit. Right here, it was an outrageous suit, but I didn't know I was in Chicago and I was being big time. I bought my first hat at a place called Birch down here, a big wooden hat. Now, you were the kid, you joined the Navy, came to Great Lakes here in Chicago. You had to have a 1942, 43 years ago, from yeah. a town called Paris, Tennessee. And I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I went to college. Now, Never been north what did before. Chicago mean? Well, this is people important. The, the meaning of Chicago to black people. Chicago meant that regardless of how badly you may have been treated in the South, the violence, the fact that your parents couldn't vote, and you had to witness all of this humiliation, that that was always Chicago, where you were equal, where you were free. to bring a message to all of you people out there, all of, our, all of the other children in the gay community. And that is the, the message of unity and the message of love. This is a house of love here. And uh, that's the reason that we're here. And we're also here to show people that you can do and you can be whoever you want to be without any fear. Uh, because there is going to always be someone there to give you the support that you need. And that's going to be just like you, that kindred spirit that you need to, to so you can feel some type of connection, so that you can feel some type of uh, belonging. So don't be afraid to be who you are. We've been talking about having a ball for what, about one or two years? And so one of our members just kindly just took it upon himself and he got tired of all the talk. He took it upon himself and he decided to go ahead and get the ball together. So we got together, we formed a little band, a little unit, a little family, and we named us, we named ourselves a house of Alvin Guard. And the 
reason why we gave ourselves that name is because the name means to set out to be different. And as a, as a whole, we were. We were very different as far as like our personality goes, uh, especially our fashions. I mean, we were Sydney pieces. <laughs> and it's like, you know, every, every time someone would see us out, we were in a piece, we were in a garment. Good afternoon, everyone. We're interactive here, so we talk back. So we need everybody to look. This is a fully interactive conversation. We want everybody to be engaged. So good afternoon, everyone. Just like you're in church. Come on, we got a little call and answer response. My name is Pamela Taylor. I'm delighted to be with you today as your moderator. And I am really delighted to introduce the gentlemen that are with us this afternoon. We have a very distinguished panel, um, and I'm delighted to see all of their faces. So if you are not familiar with them, let me introduce you, and then they will introduce themselves. So to my left, starting with Kirk Townsend. We've got Curtis McDaniel. We have the distinguished alderman, retired alderman, Howard Brookins. We've got Ray Blaney with us. Hello. And we have Earl Caldwell with us. So I'm going to let each one of them take a minute or so from left to right, introduce themselves, and then we will jump into our questions and our discussion of the day. So I presume you want a little background? A little, little background on who you are and how you got to this particular chair. OK. Uh, again, my name is Kirk Townsend. And uh, uh, I was in the uh, entertainment business for, oh God, 45 years. Uh, I'm one of the, considered one of the uh, originators of house music. Uh, I've worked, uh, I was, well I started out as a DJ and I was a DJ at one of the most infamous high schools in the city. Uh, it, I know a few of you are kind of young and might not have ever been to the Mendel parties. Uh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. <laughs> See, that's the kind of person I'm talking about. Well, I originated the Mendel bi-level parties in 1975, and uh, we grew to 
a uh, situation where we attracted over three to 4,000 kids each and every Saturday night for approximately 13 years at the school. Uh, from the time of the white flight out of Roseland to the time that the school changed over to all black, where the Augustinian priests that were running the school were going to close the school in 1979. And the revenue generated by me and uh, the school and the dancers kept the doors of the school open for another 10 years. So uh, it was uh, an honor and uh, uh, received multiple awards. Uh, and after uh, school and dealing with Mendo, I was in, went into radio and then into management. I was vice president of a record label. Uh, uh, I've done probably just about everything you can do in the entertainment business. Uh, uh, even co-managing R. Kelly for years, Bernie Mac, uh, Phyllis Hyman. Um, God, I've done so much stuff, I can't even remember half of it. And uh, worked with the United Negro College Fund as my gift back, as well as a lot of other organizations and that have uh, honored me with uh, five awards as a DJ. I'm in three halls of fame and I had four Lifetime Achievement Awards. Go figure. You would never think that they would do something like that. But uh, when God gives you a gift, you know, you're supposed to share it with others and do what it is that God puts you on earth to do. So that's what I've done. And uh, with that, uh, I was introduced to this situation uh, through Ray Blaney, who uh, he and I were friends. And uh, he introduced me to Curtis McDaniels. And Curtis had this concept about getting together to do some parties and uh, Ooh, we, look, we won't tell all that quite yet okay all right so we're go, go we're ahead gonna, Curtis. we're gonna save a little secret sauce that's enough i don't want to bore you guys curtis my name is curtis mcdowney the third after graduating from college i had an opportunity to work for a fortune 500 company such as carnation philip morris and i represented m and mars candy company i've been an entrepreneur had a t-shirt company I currently work for the city of Chicago as a supervisor in streets and sanitation. And the reason I was able to come to this chair here is that I was the originator, the originator of 601 production and we'll tell the story how we got started. And that's the brief history of myself. Thank you, Howard. My name is Howard Brookings Jr. Um, I'm an attorney, I'm a funeral director. So in law school, they would call me the ultimate ambulance chaser. I, uh, I've been practicing law for uh, more than 35 years. Uh, politician, uh, I've kind of always been active politically, whether it was in college, in college we was involved in student government, our fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha, various positions there. Law school, I was the president of the Black Law Student Association. Uh, and then I ran for all the men and won in 2023, and um, I'm sorry, 2003, and just retired 20 years ago. Um, kind of been doing both and came to this. Curtis was uh, my pledge father in uh, college, is how uh, we came to, to grow close and then started 601 with Curtis's uh, leadership. Did you mention that famous high school you went to? Oh. <laughs> He, he was able to keep me in high school, Kirk Towns. I went to Middle Catholic also. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Ray Blaney. I uh, grew up south side of Chicago. And uh, Curtis was um, my best friend at the time. This was grammar school, high school, and through college. We have traveled this journey called life together. And uh, we seemed like we were different in a lot of ways, but we were so the same in so many other ways. And anyway, we couldn't, there wasn't anything we didn't do together back then. But I was a disc jockey uh, in high school and a disc jockey, uh, uh, a DJ in, in college and, and then after. And one of my, uh, well, let me just say that back then, there were so few people who could deliver the big, the big sound. I mean, we owned the big sound back then. And so uh, the way that uh, our sound systems were back then, uh, you would have like a 12-foot stack of speakers, of horns, bass, and all of this. And if you were in a hotel situation, you'd get off the elevator and you could feel the whole 
rumble of the excitement of the event and the, that magic, one of those people who, uh, who I was, uh, who inspired me to be a, a greater, bigger disc jockey was Kurt Townsend. And I would go to those events and marvel at his, uh, his, his um, uh, delivery efforts of bringing the magic to, to the dance group. And, and I created a very similar situation uh, of my own and I had a show at the radio station. Anyway, fast forward, ended up in television, uh, ABC, Oprah, Fox, WGN, the list went on. So I'm a production person behind the scenes and this sort of thing. And so Kurt, Curtis uh, at the time was uh, bringing us all together. And anyway, I, I don't want to get into that, but that's my backstory. Uh, I enjoy people, and uh, here I am. <laughs> yes, good afternoon again. My name is Earl Caldwell. I'm a suburban guy, so I grew up in the suburbs. And because I grew up in the suburbs, then I went down south to Morehouse so I could be around some brothers and sisters. <laughs> then came back to the city after that and um, connected with um, a, a friend who was, um, you know, had just come back from LA and had mentioned uh, some of her girls were doing this thing called First Fridays and we should do it in Chicago. I was like, bet. You bring in somebody, I'll bring in somebody. So she got one of her girls, uh, Siobhan. I got one of my boys, uh, Gerald, from Mary Nook, and we started First Fridays, and so uh, that's how I'm in this chair. So how I actually know all of them um, is the fact that, yeah, we were all connected, some in college, some post-college you know, college years, definitely through you know, sororities and fraternities. You know, we have these concentric circles of relationships you know, through the community, through churches, through black organizations that kind of keep all of us connected. And so that has kept us, you know, that connective thread has gone on for 40 plus years, I would say for most of us. Um, so I know we don't look like it, but yes, we have all been connected for quite some time. Uh, but our conversation today is actually gonna do a deep dive talking about the golden age of black nightlife in Chicago. And it's a really interesting story when you start to dissect it and think the fact that these were the leaders of who were the movers and the shakers in the social life in Chicago. So we're gonna delve a little deeper into it and then we're gonna give you all an opportunity to ask questions. And in particular, I want everybody to kind of think about, you know, what was your favorite memory? you know, of those particular parties. You know, where were you going? You know, what were you wearing? What was your favorite jam? Because we will ask those questions a little later towards the end. So let's, let's get into it. So part of uh, some of the research I started to do when I kind of thought about, you know, oh, hey, we're gonna moderate this panel is, we lived in what is considered the golden age of black nightlife in Chicago. And so in the late 80s and early 90s, which certainly tells our age, Chicago was the place to be, right? Right? Anybody, look, anybody out there old enough to know? Okay. So, you know, it was a good time. You could have a good time and not worry about safety. You could go out, you know, for those of you all who remember WBMX radio, right? Who would put on the radio station and get ready to go out and while you were getting dressed. So some of the destinations that you see on the screen, you know, besides the party groups, the nightclubs that were open, Dijois and All Jokes Aside and the Jazz Oasis, you know, there were just a plethora of different clubs to be able to go and hang out. And entertainment in the 80s and the 90s was unlike anything else. So, you know, we were able to have fun and come out as a group and Things started to change, you know, through the 90s, and we're going to talk about what some of those impacts actually used to be. So let's see how well people remember. Does anybody remember what this club is? Oh. So, so we're going to take care of some technical matters for a moment.
our tech person and he'll see if he can figure out what's going on, but we'll keep the conversation going. Okay, so anyway, so before there were cell phones, which is why it's hard to find any photos of what took place at those particular parties, right? Um, black people in Chicago were forging you know, connections and building communities. And a lot of those social groups were actually the glue, right? The hair was big, it was you know, the dynasty of the show dynasty, so you had the big shoulder pads and the double-breasted suits, everybody was fly. But the black social scene in Chicago was amazing. So, the first question. What do you think actually sparked the creation of these vibrant party groups and nightclubs? Was it a particular event? Was it something cultural that was happening in Chicago or a void thereof? Was it the political scene of kind of what was taking place? So, I'm gonna toss it to you all and each one of you all kind of weigh in on, you know, what, what became the genesis of the black social party groups? Kirk? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, my slant is probably slightly different, having done things in the 70s as well, and knowing the people whose shoulders I stood on who did things. Um, uh, first off, let me survey the crowd. How many Westsiders we got in here? Southsiders? Northsiders? Suburbanites? All right. Okay. So, I, you know, I just want to make sure I speak to everybody. So, when I look back at it with a lot of my friends, I, I was fortunate that I was on the crust, the crux of uh, people that did major things in the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, I'll give you, for instance, like, if you're in a club now, you see this guy come in with all these roses that he sells. His name is William Barnett. William Barnett used to do at least four to five parties a week, and he only advertised on radio. He had a $20,000 advertising budget per week for his parties, and he was doing things like the Golden Fork and uh, the Happy Medium. Uh, wherever there was a place that would, first of all, uh, allow blacks to have parties, because we are still talking about Chicago in the 60s and 70s. And then to have them on that scale, and there were a lot of guys uh, that did it on that scale. So I saw a little bit of this as I was growing up as a youngster. And then when I got into it more in the 70s, there were still people who were like Don Cheatham and, and Phil Johnson and, and, and uh, Pintad and a lot of these different clubs that were doing these major parties. And I think, like a lot of things, nothing just uh, is there. It all evolves and it all rotates. Everything is cyclical in life and, and it's, it all rotates. And it comes to a term where you find yourself uh, in a situation, just like on the west side, you know, uh, you know, I can think back to the, 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 you know, all the different clubs, the, the Keenan's Club, the Daniel Hale, uh, uh, the Hamlin House, Resurrection. Uh, there's so many different things that create these atmospheres that run their course, and then it's time for the next generation to come in and do their thing with it. And I think at the point that we all got together, it was at a, a lull from the generation before us, and we created something that was, for our age group at that time, was just phenomenal. And uh, once you put all the right pieces together of the puzzle, the rest is history. Right, and echoing on that, is um, so going back to because you talked about the 70s, 60s, 70s, that time, and, and then coming in, and then for First Friday. So, this is now the, the early 90s. And so, came back to the city, went to school, came back, and there was, you know, you all were there. I, you know, I'd heard about it 
Um, but again, the friend said, well, we should do, we should do it. We should do a party. And the, the brother I brought in, Gerald, we were doing our own parties anyway. So we were kind of in the scene doing our thing. And, but to go back to your question in terms of what happens, I think part of it is you know, we created that ambiance for people that we knew to come and catch that feeling. And so then we brought in a couple folks and then that reached out to different folks and it built. So you, while we had the overlap, you all were hanging with folks you would hang out with and do your thing, we would do it too. And then there were other groups who were doing the same thing. So you had various groups catching their feeling, catching their vibe in their way, but it was all at the same time in this dynamic time, yeah, before cell phones and all that, where you, you don't have the pictures, but you know the parties, the uh, folks dressing up, the energy, that sort of thing, all is going on, but the environment was big enough for all of these different groups to happen and overlap at the same time. So let me just kind of pose this question, Howard, I'm gonna to toss it to you. From a political perspective, you know, one of the things, if you kind of look, and hopefully the screen is participating now, it is, you know, when you talk about generational changes, Kirk, you brought up a really good point. There was the committee, there was the Rat Pack, there were other groups that were, you know, they were older, maybe a generation or two older than we were, you know, and so we weren't necessarily at their parties, we might have been on the tail end. Was the political scene in Chicago, were those some of the catalysts of why these groups started to prevail during the 80s and 90s? Yes and maybe no. I, I, I'm in the, the, the opinion of Kurt Townsend that it was just our, our time at, the, at that point that we were out of college. I had just started practicing law. Raymond had just started his career. Curtis was gone. People were doing things. We had disposable income. We weren't married. We, were, we didn't have kids. We were we drinking. The real truth comes out. And, and go do your thing. Um, but politics helped 601. So my dad was in politics. He was a state rep and a state senator. So a lot of times they didn't want us to be in their venues downtown. Or we were the first group to, uh, a black group, to be at Faces. Faces, for those who don't know, was an exclusive white private club in what they called the Viagra Triangle, right there on uh, Rush Street, uh, next to where Gibson's is now. And hey, it was re really <laughs> exclusive of who could actually get in there. But because of my connections, I was able to talk to the general manager and Faces, quite frankly, at that time was starting to go on the decline, but they still wasn't letting black folks in there. And so I was able to say, hey, we throw this exclusive group, uh, we have an exclusive group, we throw parties, uh, we're frequented by, by people like Michael Jordan and all the entertainers, et cetera, you should let us throw a party at your place. And because I could talk to them and added credibility politically, they gave us a chance. So. We were one of the first groups to be at a lot of these venues that didn't let big, uh, black people in there, like uh, major hotels on Michigan Avenue and Faces, et cetera, and so forth. Well, and, and see, here's the, again, you, we don't get to where we are by ourselves. Now, of course, I didn't know that story, but one of the things for First Fridays was we were going to places that a lot of black folks weren't allowed to go to, but, but you all softened that up for us so that now when we came around, because again, young black professionals doing our thing, and one of our selling points were, was we were going to clubs that we weren't allowed to go to. We were some of the first to go to some of those clubs. So now we're going to places downtown that we initially weren't allowed to, but now we're going there to, to gather, socialize, have fun. But while I didn't hear that story, I'm, I'm aware that part of what, what you do, you all helped us and, and we helped some other folks to, to build it and develop it. So Curtis, as the catalyst for starting 601. Pam, can I just oh, please. backtrack on that? Yep. Excuse me, one second, Curtis. Here's another story you probably don't know. There was a black owned club in the 60s that a group of black young professionals, kind of like in the same vein you say, but they owned the club. 
So any of you guys ever been to Excalibur? I think it's called Tile now. That was a black owned club in the late 60s and in the early 70s called Fusion. And so, you know, like you said, we softened it up for you. They softened it up for us. I mean, you know, it all goes cyclical. So I just wanted to chime that in and give you a little. But that, that's an important part because there isn't anything that chronologically captures the evolution of clubs and parties and groups. Yeah, you, you miss those particular nuggets, but that's why we're here talking about it today. Okay, so Curtis. At, at, as the founder and the visionary of 601, what was the catalyst for creating the organization? Okay. I'll tell the story. Actually, prior to graduating from college, every weekend I would go out, I would run around, just enjoy parties, single, no children. Still single with no children. Just threw that in there. But, <laughs> yeah, so it was actually my mother. She said, Curtis, you go out so much, you should have your own, you should throw a party. I said, no, I don't want to throw a party. Then I thought about it. So strategically, now I'm working in corporate America, so I decided to use some of their strategic approaches. So I had to select my friends carefully and say, who do I know in different areas, different environment, different niches, who all were popular but weren't popular together? So I chose the guys and we came together like a puzzle. Well, one story, in the very beginning, we tried to have a party at the Marriott, now we'll forget. Kirkland name is Kirkland Townsend. Just so happened the comedian Townsend was down there as well. So they was giving him the VIP treatment. So when we came in to introduce ourselves, they figured we was part of the comedian Townsend. And we just said, yeah. So they gave us this big ballroom, never forget, for $500. And that kind of started the catalyst of us going downtown to the downtown hotel. So we was able to use that success at the Marriott once you're successful at one, able to pay your bills, don't have any damage to the property, other hotels such as, uh, what's another name? We'll go for the Marriott, then we will go to uh, the Holiday Inn, the Westin, all the ones on Michigan Avenue. So that kind of was the catalyst for me. My mother gave me the idea to have a party. Okay, so, so Ray, you talked about the production side of the parties and yes. you know being able to kind of emulate what you saw coming out of Kirk when you all were you know the planning of how do you put together a party and bring in a crowd from all across Chicago I'd love to hear your thoughts sure the way I'm going to answer this I'm going to uh, go back a little bit to what a little to what everybody said the chronology of giving parties I can remember back in the day People used to have parties in their basements and you'd have a collection of friends and everybody would just, uh, the magic would happen because you knew a lot of people or whatever. Then that would evolve into to, to having uh, something in, in high school. They had these uh, fun names in high school for clubs and this sort of thing. And everybody would, would have a special take on, on their party for that. Then in college, you had the fraternities and the sororities. They would put their special spin on a party uh, once a month or whatever and and so there was a trend there that we were pretty much following the trend of maybe a fraternity or the the way that uh, college organizations were putting things together um, sporadically where you did not have to go to the same location there was not the brick and mortar like like a club or anything like that but what I was able to uh, contribute to the whole party giving thing is um, was my television background and so uh, Curtis and, and the guys would uh, start with well Ray what can you do with this room and we all knew that sound was going to play a big part of it we all loved music and we knew the sound was going to be all of that and the DJs were rotating in and out we found the correct DJ but then what else could we do and so <laughs> at the time uh, screens and the ability to put images on a screen was starting to come out and so I was able to uh, do some video production to have our name 601 Productions fly around the screen. We had some great venues that lent itself to that kind of production such as um, well again the Park West they had screens jumbo screens already in the in this particular venue so we would use that we would play on that Production again, uh, we 
recognize that the people who would come to our events would put forth their best best efforts with fashion. I mean, hey, they Pam, would. I'm a bust. I'm a bust. I'm okay. a bust this right now. Go ahead. Ray's main attraction is if there was a pretty woman anywhere in the Cook County area, <laughs> Ray Blank knew who that woman was. <laughs> And so we knew as guys, in order to get people to come to our parties, we needed pretty women to be there. And so when we say, oh, we're friends of Ray Blake, oh, we'll come to your party. <laughs> so that, his production helped, but him knowing the people throughout the county also got us an entree. And then once we had the brothers there, then the women would follow, etc. It's crazy, it's funny and interesting, the, the different thing that we all brought to our organizations. And, and some people called me the, the bougie part of this and all of that and whatever. <laughs> shall, like, shall we tell them your name? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, later. That, I don't well, think there's enough we'll, time we'll, for We'll save that one. But as far as production, I loved taking a blank canvas, uh, excuse me, a blank canvas and seeing what I could do to that particular blank room and to, to, to make it different than anybody else's experience in that room, different than what I had done myself in that room. And so we were able to bring a different experience to the body of people who we had collectively harnessed. And uh, the hand picking of our own personal friends, the collections of those personal people made up uh, our, our guest list. So it was. Uh, my personal phone book, his, 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 and again, there was no cell phone, so uh, your Rolodex of people and contacts, so you bring them together and they had expectations because, again, when you go back to how little parties were prior, again, uh, college parties, backyard parties, basement parties, like, what are you going to do? You got to bring out the, you got the balloons, what you got? You got to, turn, what, what is different about your backyard party? So everybody used to put forth a little special something at, your par at their own personal parties. And that's basically what we were doing. We would do something different every month. We'd have a hot pants party. We would have a, we call it a hook. And so uh, at each one of our 601 events, we, we uh, Curtis, what would you, what would some of those other hooks that we well, had? I yeah, actually have a picture party. of some of your hooks. Okay. Um, so oh, here, before you say that part, I, I wanted to complete one of my thoughts about yep. fashion. The people who would come to our events would put forth their best efforts of, of, of looking, looking good. And the hair salons were buzzing. The barber shops, I mean, people were buying their you know, new outfits for, for our events. And uh, so we ended, up in the, we ended up giving fashion shows. And so that would lend itself to my production. We, so stages would be put together. I would create a one fashion show that we did was um, we replicated a rooftop deck, I think it was. Remember that one? There was a spiral staircase. If you could imagine this stage, at the end of the stage, okay, we had all the models, the fast, the, the, some of the most fabulous people in Chicago, and they would, we would have a casting call for our, for our fashion shows. It was a big deal. And at the time, I think, who was it, Ebony, was putting out uh, their efforts for fashion shows and stuff like that. So we were competing, not only compete, we were blowing away Corporations who were putting, they had big bu budgets is the reason that I'm right. saying it this way. We did not have that. We had just a passion for making our group of people happy and going home with a story, and they were doing that. Well, you all had very interesting collaborations, of which that's one of the ones on the screen. So the plugger was the thing that would draw people into the parties, right? Yes. So you would see people at different places, you would give out a plugger, but you all took the pluggers to the next level because you partnered with a gentleman by the name of Kevin Wack Williams, yeah. who is now a global Rural artist. Art. Absolutely. So these are some of his artwork from, this was 1989 for 601, for the fashion shows that Ray was actually talking and about. And Craig Perry was another. At, and Craig Perry, they worked together. Rest and in peace. interesting enough is the fact that, you know, they talk about the impact on fashion you had to be dressed to come to these you parties. Had to be dressed. There, there were, were no gym shoes. shoes. You know, Jackets there were no were jeans, jackets. You saw ties on gentlemen. Ladies wore dresses and suits. And so you saw an upperly mobile crowd. 
that was actually flowing. Absolutely. So, Earl, it was a great networking opportunity. It was a great also. networking opportunity. I'm going to toss it. So we're going to talk about the genesis of how. Right. So you say networking, and and that's interesting. So you, you, you're in the late '80s. So we started First Fridays in '92, in the fall of '92, and we labeled it an after work networking. Nice hook. And socializing affair. So after work. So again, young professionals in the city, after work, come, you know, network, hang out, and that's how we framed it. So people are coming from work, presumably suit, tie, you know, nicely dressed because you're a young professional or doing doing something. And we did it 90 October, November, December of 1992, we first did it. A couple hundred people, 150, 200 people, uh, the first three. January of, two, of 1993, the first Friday was New Year's, so we didn't do it. But then in February, uh, you talk about that magic, it was like the perfect storm. So the word had gotten out about First Fridays um, for the February First Fridays. Uh, the First Fridays in February was unusually warm in Chicago. So folks were like, oh, okay, let me go out. Then this first Friday's thing, and what were we? We were at a club that nobody had been to before. It was a spot that nobody, that black folks hadn't been to before. So the word is out, new spot, warm day. And from that initial 150 to 200 folks that in February, we had 500 plus folks. And then every month after that, until it was in thousands, and then it, the word was out, and it was just what it became. And so while it started as that after work networking and socializing affair, then I, I came to learn because I didn't understand it. But then I heard people were like, yeah, they would go home from work and change <laughs> to come to the, 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 the event. And folks would get dressed up to come to the event. And, and then we did more than that, as you just talked about. So you all did fashion shows. So we had... Um, uh, artists come in. So, what was the brother name who wrote the book? Uh, why do Why do men cheat? What was his? Uh... Yeah. Well, so he he wrote a book and he was on television. But when he first wrote the book, we had him in, and and so we had artists come in. We had live performances, uh, and then we even let other folks. So it evolved into that community. That okay, other folks doing things, that sort of thing, and a part of our appreciation. Then we had. Um, put up uh, the first Friday's fest where we had at Washington Park just the three one day you supported us so let's support you vendors music food drinks to give back to everybody who gave it to us but that was our kind of evolution and spin on how we did it with with the group that we were working with so let, let's talk about how a lot of these things evolved and the people who were actually at the parties so there's a different kind of construct of, you know, the groups of different friends and parties. You talked about it evolved from Rolodex to email messages. But let's talk about the folks who were in attendance and kind of that demographic, especially as we start to, you know, kind of change into those more sophisticated parties. So were they buppies? You know, you all heard the term yuppies, you know. Were these black buppies who were running around with money with their first cars and first jobs that were giving you all their coins? Curtis, tell, tell us, who were the people who were showing up at these parties? Well, I wouldn't classify ourselves as that, but that's what people would say. One of the unique things that we offer is that we treated everyone with service, class, and professionalism to the point where actually such people as Lisa Ray, she participated in one of our fashion shows. The comedian, Bernie Mac, actually performed for us many, many times. We had Adele Givens, she performed for us. Cheryl Underwood, but we treated them really nice and gave them opportunity to perform in front of a large crowd of black people that didn't necessarily have a chance. And before Def Jam came out, we actually used to pioneer at the Park West, our annual Thanksgiving comedy show. Raymond Blaney would fix up the stage, it would look like a comedy show, and we would have local comedians perform, and several of them have become, become big names. So we took our things that we learned from corporate America, and we brought it together. That's what I would say. Oh. 
Howard. So we, we also had famous artists. R. Kelly was a, a frequent uh, uh, performer at our show. Um, I can't think of who the other. We had numerous. But, uh, we had I, numerous. No, and, and, but even with our fashion show, Barbara Bates was the one who did uh, the local who did our, our, our fashion shows. And so we had, you know, people from everywhere doing uh, big stuff and, and they came to know us as doing that. And we kind of kept the crowd kind of exclusive because there, there's always been kind of two Chicago. We weren't the stepping crowd. We, that, that just wasn't us. And we also weren't the thug crowds, but that doesn't mean that people who dealt in cash and they were non-pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical salesmen didn't show up, <laughs> but, but they were there. But then we also had every major star from every, that was black, from every major team in Chicago that would show up at our parties. And yeah, we had to do it the old fashioned way, literally, taking your information down and mailing you a plugger. And then you had us on the street. So uh, two of our members are not here, which is uh, Gerald Davis. Gerald was a Kappa from, South, uh, from Western who died. Uh, uh, he actually died my first year in office. So that would have been about 2003, 2004. And then Grover Calvert. But we would literally See, I was in traffic court at the time as a, a young public defender. We would literally see pretty women and would be handing them a plugger, no matter where we were. And, and that's how we were able to get people to the party. You know, let me, let me differ a little bit, you know, and again, how things evolve. I think part of it was, like with any marketing aspect of what you do, uh, the perceived value of what you create in your product will always either guarantee or, or, or ruin your situation. So I think it was because but with the six of us, we all had something unique within ourselves that brought different elements to the parties. Uh, uh, Ray's people were different, Howard's people were different. Grover's people were suburban. Uh, Curtis's people were, were, were uh, Grover and Gerald were more of the, the frat, sorority, college people that they knew and now were in professional life. Um, um, I, you know, I was always a, a business aspect of looking at things uh, uh, and how they rotate, just like they're saying, you know, I. Uh, for 20 years, even before I, we evolved in the 601, I did the uh, celebrity fashion show for the United Negro College Fund. And, uh, you know, we got to the point where we were attracting 14, 1,500 people, uh, shows and packing rooms and doing things. And, you know, having those kind of experiences and, and formats to deal from kind of sweetens the pot. Now, I'm going to put out here just two of my favorite situations for us at 601. One was when we first did the, uh, I, I knew the guy at Navy Pier, and we did, a lot of you guys probably don't know it, there was a big ship that used to dock on Navy Pier called the SS Clipper. And we did a party on the Clipper, and it was so packed, the boat kept sinking further and further into the water. And they would have to adjust the ramp that people would walk up on the, the ramp. They would have to adjust it about five or six times to accommodate people to still come on board and exit the ship. And I, I just thought that was just a, a, a prime moment for us because Phil Johnson, a lot of different people that came before us used to do parties on the Clipper and it was never that effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think number two, and, and Raymond, you might appreciate this, we all came up with the idea of doing a black tie Christmas party. And we wanted to get the ambassador east, but they wouldn't give it to us. So we ended up at the ambassador west, across the street. And you know, we wanted to be daring enough to go where, <laughs> I don't want to sound like Star Trek or nothing, but to go where that no one's gone before and uh, you know to have 
all these black folks in black tie and tuxes and, and evening wear and just having a good time in a world-renowned hotel. So let me just, just, let me just spectacular. interject there. So the way the Christmas party came to effect is my father was a member of the Chicago Assembly that always had an annual black tie Christmas party the day after Christmas. So I was telling Curtis, hey, we should do this as being a young, it was impressive to me, but we weren't doing it at our age. And so that's one of the ways we started doing it with our spin on it. Right, and so when you talk about, you talk about boats, so um, as you were talking about the crowd and your ambiance, so similar, um, you know, kind of the young professionals, because came back to the city, folks are working, they have their job at, you know, downtown working for whether it be a bank or a law firm or uh, advertising and that sort of thing. So that's part of the crowd. So part of what we evolved to from First Friday is besides, you know, having artists and, and the First Friday Fest, put back up the picture. So we had, um, right, so you see that BET um, banner, you're like, well, okay, well, what's that? So we had a cruise and we went to the Bahamas and we coordinated it with BET, and at the time, uh, Rachel Stewart was a fine uh, VJ, and so um, with our crews and BET in Bahamas, <laughs> we were like, well, yeah, let's, let's go on and carry on you know, in the Bahamas, and so that's what that image uh, of the BET and some of the folks who participated, but that was some of the things that it just evolved to because it just lends itself to, well, where else do we want to go creatively and, and, and provide an experience uh, and, and engage with, with, the, with the audience, with the people, and so. So you bring up a really good point, and we're going to create some intersections here between what happened socially in Chicago and what was happening nationally as well. So that late 80s, early 90s, there was a gentleman, he is a journalist and author and president of the African American Film Critics Association. He states the fact that the portrayal of blacks in the 80s and the 90s, you start to see an expansion of our identities. He notes that the black representation on TV transformed how black people were seen, not only nationally, but globally, right? But the biggest change arguably came within the 90s. So let's go back for a second. Did the rise of black entertainment platforms like TV shows, you know, Fresh Prince started then, um, movies like House Party came out, New Jack City. How did that influence culture in Chicago? You could see it in the apparel, you could see it in the way that we carried ourselves. But because you all were at the forefront of the intersection of culture and socialization, did entertainment have any impact on what was happening here socially in Chicago? So I'm gonna to toss it to Curtis. Quietly known, actually, it did. Budweiser were actually, they had come to our events, they actually gave us a $20,000 sponsorship. Of course, we were young, we didn't do right by the money. Instead of investing in something, we just took it and divided it up. That's when you're young. But they saw the desire and the need to know that the group we had had actually catapulted itself to help people to try different brands. So that's one way that corporate America did understand us. Another thing we would try to do, if you look around the room, we would take different promotional concepts that corporations had. We had 601 watches. 601 buttons. So we did try to emulate things that corporate America had done as well. Well, right, and, and you're right, you talk about Budweiser, and similarly, uh, we had corporate folks come, uh, because again, when you have uh, a, a large amount of people, they're, they're about selling whatever it is that they're selling, uh, drinks, dresses, apparel, whatever, and when you have an audience, a market, they want to tap into it, and then of course, uh, a, a, a black market with people with disposable income and that sort of thing. And so similarly, they came to us too in terms of the corporate sponsors and wanting to um, work with us or how did you get it or be a part of what we were doing because of the audience that we had. And ultimately, they're trying to get in your pocketbook. So uh, we were a possible avenue to help them get to the, the broader market that they were looking for. Pam, uh, again, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, 
But I, I, I really want to drive home Evolve because I see the young people in the room. And it's not just about what we can do. It, it, we're sharing these stories so that maybe you can see some similarities in how you can take this to your generation and create 602 productions. And, uh, you know, uh, we owe it to people like, uh, who broke the glass ceilings like Tom Burrell, uh, Barbara Proctor, uh, uh, at this time, all these African Americans were getting their own advertising agencies and understood the value of black dollars being spent. Just like now, uh, we're part of at least $3 trillion of the national budget of money that's being spent on a daily basis, but the majority of our money, as I look around the room, I see Nikes, I see Converse, I see all these things. They're not coming back into our own pockets. So I can't, and again, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the idea of telling these stories and showing how the evolution works is that this young lady here can do something that she feels could take to her generation and, and uh, start something and, and come up with a marketing idea or something that it could be jumping rope. It could be a, anything, you know, you just gotta feel for your passion and get an understanding of where it is you wanna go. And because that's where the next steps are, that's where the next level is in this circle of life, so. And Kirkland, I'd like to add this to the conversation. Uh, you asked earlier about the clientele, the kind of people who were coming to these events the formula that seemed to work was not that it was any one type of people, it wasn't in one class of people or one anything, it was the potpourri of cultures, ethnicities, well, we predominantly black, but from different walks of life, and people would hear about our dance parties and they would uh, come to town for the first time and, and, and have a chance, an opportunity, a privilege to check out one of our our shows. It was like a, it was like a, like, like a, it was more than a dance party because we had entertainment. Uh, at the beginning, we had separate rooms where we would have a jazz room in one room, and then we'd have, uh, um, uh, let's see, what was it, a dance party in another room, and then we had uh, uh, ice sculpture and food and, and just people collecting in the lobby. My point, everyone wanted something, looked for something different at the party. Everyone was there for a different reason. Some people liked it because of the fashions. Another person, other people liked it because of the networking opportunities. Uh, some other people, so it wasn't just about like having all alphas or sigmas or whatever in a fraternity organization. It was the collection of, of this level of people, that level of people, and, and, and all of those in between, that we, turned, that we learned would be the formula of a good party when you had some of everybody coming together, enjoying good music, a good, everyone was well-dressed, and uh, just the, um, I'm missing the word. <laughs> Well, 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 but part of it is what, what you're saying is when we're talking about what we did because the, 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 uh, how we framed the conversation is 80s, 90s, cultural Chicago nightclubs, that sort of thing. But what we're talking about and the other folks who were doing it at the time is we all found a formula to attract people that would come consistently over years and and part with their money and be involved. And so what we're talking about is that you talk about you, you, the, the next generation and repeating it is whatever it is that you all want to do, and you might want to be an artist, you might want to be a writer, you're still going to have to figure out what that thing is that is of interest to people for them to want to be involved with whatever it is that you're doing. And what we're talking about, what we're sharing a little bit with you is about what we did at that particular place in time that allowed us to be successful. And then I think as you look at us again, individually as we all have moved on for that, we have taken some of those lessons and, and have taken them into other professions and other things that we're doing that helped us to be successful in life. And so those qualities, uh, the, the work ethic, the discipline, um, 
the, the uh, emotional intelligence, the, the things that are gonna help you be successful now will help you be successful in anything that you do. Would you say too, I think we were, we were a unique bunch of risk takers back then too. Individually and collectively, we did not mind uh, putting our credit card uh, on a given venue or a room or a hotel because in order to have a party, say, for October, you need to reserve the room today. I mean, we would have credit cards across Chicago just to reserve a venue for that particular month. And um, so the climate back then was, it was very risky, and we did not mind taking the risk individually and collectively, and, and that made us a fun group, too, I think. But you know, I wanted to go back to something that Carmel talked about. So before it was First Fridays, the way the place that you would hang out after work was Bennigan's or Houston's. Yeah. Those were the Bennigan's on South Water Street or the Houston's. And, and, that's, and those were the two spots that yeah. we, we were kind of welcomed at. Right. And you'd see people after work and then plot up, okay, where are we going, what's going on, et cetera. And there have always been people who were doing something a little bit different, like a certain group of girls used to throw parties in uh, Union Pier, Michigan all the time in the, in the summer. But there was something that we did and it was a hook, but the meeting spot before First Fridays was Bennigan's and Houston. So interesting question then to all of you all and then we're gonna toss it to the crowd to ask questions and kind of give us your favorite memories as well from the 80s and the 90s. So we talked about potentially how we've all evolved through this and there's been different iterations of social groups and parties that have come and gone. What actually caused the, you know, the ending of those particular social groups? And in particular, the nightclubs that used to be around, you know, the Intas, the Jazz Oasis. And is there an opportunity for a resurgence for the next generations that are so out there? I think there's always a rebirth and a regeneration because it gets stale and we got old and we got other responsibilities. We started getting married. Uh, we started having kids. So we started having other responsibilities as opposed to Curtis being out in the nightclub passing out pluggers to three in the morning. And so it, 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 yes, there are other things that can be there and we even tried to start a youth group it just didn't work out that well, where Lil Lewis, which was a famous DJ for the youngest, that younger than us, was the DJ to their parties. They just did not work. But we always believed that we had a shelf life, which is why we never wanted to have a brick and mortar club or a shot away against it, because I don't care what club there was, the hottest clubs in Chicago, New York, et cetera, wherever they've been, at some point, they closed down. And so we tried to keep it fresh and different by jumping from place to place and with different things. Yes, I would agree with that. It's, uh, you know, you, you have your group that you're doing it with and there's a shelf life because as you said, think, this thing called life happens and so other responsibilities happen. And so just organically it moves on or you get pushed out because somebody behind you has come up with uh, the new, fresher way to do what we've done, and then that, that lends itself to it. And so I think part of it is just a part of this thing called life, except that, you know, in certain, in this kind of industry, uh, it, it kind of ends, and then there will be a new group that comes. But if you think in business and that sort of thing, think of Disney, you know, at, at, per generation, they'll bring back you know, Pinocchio and Pocahontas and Peter Pan. And Peter Pan is real cool now. Peter Pan wasn't cool when we were growing up, but they um, updated the image. It's just Pan, now I think it's just Peter. And so every generation, it gets updated and refreshed. And so for us, the, the update and refresh would be whoever the group, because there's some group doing something now, it's just not us, but somebody is entertaining, somebody is, is doing what we're doing, but it's different now because there's technology, it's different, the manifestation of it is different, but somebody is doing what we're doing, but it's done differently. So I want to toss this out to the crowd, and I know that we need to wrap up soon, but I'd love to know if there are people who have questions, and in particular, what was your favorite memory from the 80s and the 90s, and to kind of help prompt some of that as well. 
we're gonna talk about, hey, do you remember these you know, particular dance moves? You know, so who remembers the running man? Who can still do the running man? Better question. Okay, we got one young person in the back. The Cabbage Patch. Okay. Roger Rabbit. Ah. Uh, just give us a so we can see it. No, no, no. No, they don't want to. Just, just a little Roger Rabbit or Cabbage yeah, Patch. So right us, there. Right, so give us, give us. Uh, in short, the uh, kind of the era that I started dancing between 1988 and 1996. Okay. So I uh, came up in that era. When, um, How old were you in that era? I was 10. Okay. <laughs> just, to fr just to frame it up for reference. Okay, great. Uh -huh. All right, but face this way so the camera so we can get you. So here, yeah, come back and so give us a little bit of the running man. Let's see the running man. That's it. Okay. All right. So cabbage patch. Right. So what about the Tootsie Roll? Okay. All right. What about the hammer dance? Go hammer. Go hammer. Go hammer. Can't touch this. Can you can't, can't test it? Okay. All right. All right, then look, for this particular one, we need, you know, a group, two people. Sure. Who remembers the kid and play? Oh, kid and play. Who, anybody can do the kid and play? Yeah. Well, you need two people to do the kid and play. Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit, okay. All right, so questions for the audience, comments from the audience, thank you. Give them a round of applause. What, what's your name? Uh, Dante. Dante, thank you, for be, thank you for being our dance instructor for the day. So anybody, you know, in particular, any questions or favorite memories? You know, who was the person who said that they used to go to the mental bi-level disco parties? Oh, she left. Oh, she left. Well, we, we came up in the generation right after, right after you all. So. Right when Mendel was going over to St. Martin de Porres. but we so we would hear the stories. We grew up in Rose when the we, Rose. We weren't old enough. We you see the flyers. We see the flyers and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, our <laughs> sister and me, y'all do. Yeah, yeah. So, and it's you know, um, and we did go to Catholic school, a much better one than y'all. So I'm sorry. <laughs> what Mark school Carmel. was that? We went to Mount Carmel. Oh, so okay. yeah, but oh. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 no, but 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 just just the, just the foundation that you all set. Like uh, we just knew, like in our generation, where we where we had had to hit, you know what I'm saying? And just in general, um, professionally, uh, all over the place, you know. So yeah, just 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 thank you all for gratitude. Yeah. Thank you all for keeping it going, and uh, we have to inspire everyone else, other people, different groups to do. But you, but you know, we might have still been doing this if we'd have known that people would actually go to a day party. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. It's like yeah. we can't stay up to three in the morning, but we can get our drinking on tonight. Well, well, so, so interesting question. Me, uh, what it, what is the evolution of what black social life looks like now? Pam, so, let me let me just throw something in here. Then. These are all corporate guys. I put food on the table, and not just then, but still now, doing this work. You know, I, this was a life mission for me. So, you know, I didn't have a corporate job. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, having to deal with that, you know, you have to transform and, and, and yourself, your, 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 your product, your, your brand, you know, with the times. And you gotta, you know, keep searching for that next thing, that next it. And uh, uh, for, example, for example, right now I'm, I'm doing work with, uh, uh, and I call myself kind of retired, but I'm doing work with Terry Hunter, uh, you know, who is a three-time Grammy-nominated producer, DJ producer. And um, right now, the, 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 the trend in the marketplace, like Beyonce, uh, you know, he was nominated for Beyonce's, you know, uh, Break My Soul, and, and uh, 
So everybody wants to try and do house music. So, you know, uh, Drake, uh, you know, so when you see these trends and you have to jump on them and you have to ride that, that, that bad boy till you can't ride it no more. And I came to him with an aspect of, dude, let's take some old stuff and through AI and other methods. Uh, so I was working with uh, the Charles Stepney Foundation and a lot of people don't know who Charles Stepney is, but uh, he, without Charles Stepney, he wouldn't have had no Earth, Wind and Fire, no Ramsey Lewis, no Minnie Ripperton. Uh, so anyway, uh, we found 97 reels of unreleased music for him, and we're going to be releasing one of the tracks real soon. And um, through the magic of technology, we were able to take one of the tracks that was a ballad done by Kitty Haywood back in 1975. And Kitty Haywood is the mother of Jason Weaver. And her sister, they had their group, Kitty and the Haywoods. Her sister is the mother of Tricky, you know, one of the great producers that works with all these pop artists and all these different things. So, you know, and now we, we were able to take a ballad and turn it into a house record. And, you know, we did a drop in that DJ Jazzy Jeff and, and a lot of different guys came on. They said, well, we'll pop in and then we got to pop out. But the information that was being passed in that, they all stayed on there for two hours where nobody else could get into the drop in. I mean, Louis Vega, uh, Kenny Dope, uh, all the major players in the world doing this stuff now. So I say all this to say that, you know, you have to transform your your brand transform your product and you have to constantly look for the next thing that will catapult you to especially if you do this for a living and uh, that's always been my forte because when I started out as a DJ I started out DJ and making fifty dollars a party and when I got my first big thing at Mendel they were paying me five hundred dollars a night and ten percent of the door and that was in 1977 that's when $500 was $500. And uh, so, you know, you have to, if you want to do this and do it for a living, you have to have an understanding that there are certain things that you have to do, especially when you don't know when that next check is coming and until Kirkland. you create it. And I want to add too, Kirkland, that I salute you guys, anybody in the audience who wants or <laughs> has ever had an opportunity to bring people together, to put an event together. It is so rewarding. It's, it's, it's so, there's such great satisfaction in, in, in bringing people together. And, and, and when your plan, when your, when your magic comes together the way you envisioned it, it just, it's, it's a lot of fun. And it makes you want to continue to do it over and over and over, and you get better at it. So I salute anybody who is out there, all of you guys, uh, if, if there is a takeaway, anything that you can or learn from us, uh, it's, a, it's a shame. It's so sad that our society doesn't allow us to do it as easily as we were able to pull it off then. Uh, and I also want to bring to the, to the uh, forefront that it was a lot of work. These events that we did once a month, that was a lot of work. And some, of the, some members of the group had more time, some had more passion and interest. But at the end of the, uh, it's like almost putting on a, uh, if you could imagine what goes into putting on somebody's wedding or something like that. We had to do, we did that with pleasure once a month. And uh, so the joy would certainly uh, outweigh all of the headache, the burdens, the concerns, and the problems that would come along with it. We, we knew how to deal with them all. We learned how to deal with them all. And that's the part that I think we got better at. So, uh, interesting question. Is there an opportunity for a resurgence of a black social group for the folks who I are in, so. in not, this particular not. age range or for those who are out there? <laughs> for those who are out there, I, I, I hope there was something that was learned here today that would inspire others to do what we did. Chicago needs it. Chicago deserves it. And, uh, you know, the brick and mortar sites are falling by the wayside for one reason or another. 
And um, it, it was always interesting to see how people would look forward to our events once a month, even though there were these brick and mortar places. People, I think, enjoyed uh, the effort, the show business aspect of it. It was like we were putting on a production. When you came to our events, it was, they could appreciate that someone put forth all of this thought and effort. Again, if I could compare it to somebody going to a wedding, it's like, wow, you all did this for us? And people appreciated that, and, and not many uh, hosts um, would go the extra mile to give, to leave people with an experience worth talking about. And we would do that month after month. We would generate, create ideas and an experience, and the people who would attend would bring their magic to the event. And it was something worth talking about and worth redoing every month. So, so Pam, that just to answer you, there's, there's a lot of people that are still out here doing it. Uh, uh, Jeff Johnson and, and uh, 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 Mark just had Mark uh, Fuller. No, not Mark Fuller. Uh, Mark, uh, his dad is the liquor distributorship. Uh, I just can't think of his name. Mark Allen. No, there, his his. This his is what dad. happens when you get older. Folks. Yeah, yeah, you you got that right. But anyway, they just had a a, a big event three weeks ago at Navy Pier. And 5,000 people showed up. So, you know, I mean, there's still people out here doing it. I mean, and. and Is there a chance for a Ben Gay generation party? Group? Oh, Ben Gay. The Ben Gay generation. <laughs> I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> fortunately enough, there, there's still people out here doing things, and, and, and the, the climate's slightly different, but it's supposed to be different because it's a different time, different. Uh, uh, different audience, different things that, that resonate, but it's still room to recreate some of the things, especially now, Ray, you probably would have a field day with AI and all the different technologies that have grown since then that people can take and create things. It, it's, it's magical, but... Uh, so parting know. thoughts for everybody. So yeah. Kirk. But nothing, nothing's ever going, everything's cyclical. Nothing's ever going to just go away. Nothing ever just appears. Things evolve, they rotate, they come back, uh, you know, you have to have uh, all the stars aligned at whatever time you decide to do something. Uh, you know, what we did at Mendel will never be replicated. I don't think the, the, uh, the way things are in Chicago right now that you can put 4,000 kids in one place weekly and not have an incident, you know. And uh, I don't think they ever did anything like that at Mount Carmel. But, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> but that's a unique situation. That, that was a very unique situation. And, uh, uh, but there are people that find ways to do it. And, and uh, I, you know, it makes me proud that, you know, we were able to set forth whatever it is, which I try to get across to everybody, you know, just find what drives you, find what passion you have, and have an understanding of what it takes to make it happen and, and how you make it happen, so. I'd like to say, uh, just listen to what we've said and- Mark Rand. Make your own way. That was his name. Oh, Mark Rand, yeah. <laughs> so, that's my final thought. Just enjoy yourself and have fun with it. And make some money. Is there a resurgence opportunity? You think? Oh yes, we can all probably get together and do a day party sponsored by Ben Gay or someone. <laughs> yes, there and you all will be invited. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, two things. One, one, this this obviously helped me because running a campaign is like going out for a party. You got to go up to somebody you don't know. You got to talk to them and you gotta convince them to do something. In that case, vote for me. But the thing about this, and I tell young people, because there's young people in the room, is that you do what you love and money will follow. I, I mean, at one night, we got like 10 grand a piece back in the day. And yeah, we, are, we 
each differently did something. I'm sure Ray invested his, and right now it's worth a couple million dollars. <laughs> Curtis, bought, Curtis bought the latest Nikes, and if he saved them, they would be worth a couple million dollars. But I, I mean, we had fun at it, we made money, and uh, I just tell people to follow your passion, do what you're good at, and money will follow you if, if you really like doing that. You can figure out a way to make money at whatever it is that you like and you do. Great. Final thoughts? My final thoughts was, would be this. Um, personally, I think working hard and playing hard is my personal model. <laughs> so when I, would put to, when, when I had my role with the 601 uh, events, I mean, it was, there was so much work. It was hard to get these guys to, 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 to subject themselves Sorry, to. there were workers. There were. And there were <laughs> <laughs> I, I loved getting a van. I loved getting a van, going to the burbs, picking up the latest light equipment, fog machine, whatever, laser. This. I mean, that was my passion. Some, one man's play is another man's work. I mean, I could look at somebody on the basketball court running up and down it. You're making me tired just walking. I mean, watching this person. That's, that person's fun to someone else. That's work. Do you get what I'm saying? So that was play for me. To put those parties together, to go through all of that work was fun. I loved it. And I could not expect for everyone in the group to feel the same way about the headache portions of it. You know, bring, getting the, how to, the logistics of getting the sound equipment here and the microphones on everybody and the spotlight and how are the... The, the, the model's going to dress and all of that. I loved all of that stuff. So uh, the whole notion of uh, working hard and playing hard are my final thoughts. And uh, that's, that's who I am. And everyone has their different um, uh, thing that they brought to the organization. And, and everyone here has some talent, gift, and passion that, that they bring to, to uh, their gatherings. Whenever they put, they put their, whenever someone is putting their family functions together or whatever. There are parts about it that they love and other people don't love. Maybe this person loves to cook. Maybe this person loves to, to, to set up the backyard like it looks like um, Italy or something like that. Everyone has their passion. Enjoy your passion, have fun with it, and uh, bring people together. I, this is the fun of life, bringing people together. Just like today? Just like today, so. As um, uh, the brothers have talked about your know, passion, your talent, do what you love, that sort of thing, I'm going to phrase it a little differently in the sense that while you may have something that you love to do uh, or want to do, uh, what is your value proposition? Value proposition. You may love to sing, but if you don't know how to put that together in a way that somebody will buy your song, then you're just singing to yourself. You're not able to mobilize and create what you want to do. And so whatever it is that you want to do, think about your value proposition, writing, singing, business, whatever it is. Because within your individual value proposition, you then have to create a way for you to be able to be successful with that and think about how is your value proper proposition differentiated from somebody else to do it. 601 figured it out. First Fridays figured it out. Individually, folks have figured it out to be successful. What is it that you want to do? What is your value proposition? And how are you going to manifest that for you to be successful in whatever that is? That's what I leave for you because that will then lead for your happiness for your success and that sort of thing and it's something that you can't do by yourself you see this whole bootstraps piece is not real the reason that we're here is because somebody has helped us be here somebody contributed to my individual success my collective success and part of why we're here is to share with you because we know that that we were fortunate and blessed to be here and to the extent that we can give something back to help you achieve something that you might want to achieve, then that's why we're here. And so I would leave you with whatever your value proposition or propositions, because it may be more than one, 
you know, how are you going to realize that? What is your differentiation in that so that you can be successful in whatever that you want to do? And that's what I would leave you to think about and reach out to people to help because if you, if you need somebody to help, somebody will help you if you reach out because what you're looking for is looking for you. All right. I'm going to wrap it up with the fact that, you know what, it takes individuals to come together collectively to build community. And what these gentlemen have done, they have individually built communities that still continue to thrive to this day. Might not be on the party scene, but their work experiences and their business ethics have created entrepreneurs, have created corporate success, have created political runs, you know, and so if the challenge, you know, we now are going to toss the mantle to you all. So the opportunity is what becomes the next 601? What becomes the next First Fridays? What becomes your business idea that you've been holding on to and you weren't sure, you know, like how it should come together? It doesn't come together individually. Like they said, it comes together collectively. You've got a lot of talent in this room. And the question becomes, does everybody in this room know each other? And how do you all now network to bring together what's next? Because that's what it's time for. It's called, it's time to bring forth what's next in the platform. That could be just as successful, if not more. You've seen collaborative partnerships that have happened here between networks and different businesses. So what's your idea? What's your dream? We are here to be able to pour into you now to help you manifest what's next. And we can't wait to see what comes next. So with that, we will thank you. And we'll turn it over to the team. Give our, give our panelists a round of applause.